This is Taiwan Insider, a weekly news roundup brought to you by Radio Taiwan International. Each week, we give you an inside look at the biggest and most interesting stories coming out of Taiwan. I'm Natalie So, and I'm Andrew Ryan, and here's your week in a minute. Kaohsiung Mayor Han Guoyu says he is willing to be included in the KMT's 2020 presidential primary. The party is reforming its primary to include the popular Han, though he has not announced he wants to run for president. After meeting with the KMT chairman this week, Han says he will respect any arrangement that includes him in the primary. Two U.S. warships passed through the Taiwan Strait on Sunday. It is the seventh time U.S. warships have made such a passage since July 2018. President Tsai says the Taiwan Strait is international waters and is open to all. The U.S. Senate passed a resolution reaffirming U.S. commitment to Taiwan. It calls for continued arms sales to Taiwan and for high-level visits between the two sides. The House of Representatives passed the same resolution in April. Guatemalan President Jimmy Morales is wrapping up a state visit to Taiwan. He has met with President Tsai, the legislature president, and Guatemalan students in Taiwan. Over 100 same-sex couples have registered to marry on May 24th. That's the deadline the Constitutional Court set two years ago for same-sex marriage to be legalized. Household registration offices are preparing to process their applications. And that's your Week in a Minute. Every week at the top of the show, we each come up with a word of the week. A word that we think describes this week. Okay, you want to guess my word, Andrew? All right, let's see what do you have. Friend? Not friend. Free? Free coffee? Free freedom. Coffee. <laughs> 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 All right, so freedom. I believe it relates to some of our stories today. The U.S. is showing its freedom of nav navigation through mm -hmm. international waters by passing through the Taiwan Strait. Also, um... The KMT is exercising their freedom to use, choose any candidate to participate in their primary for the presidential uh, race. I mean, Han Guoyi, who is a very popular politician, the new mayor of Kaohsiung, has not even said he's going to run or he wants to run, but they're including him in this poll, in this primary anyway. Uh, also, see. when we talk about street food, and I think there's a little bit of freedom associated with that because you don't have to worry about the price. That's very right. Cheap, right? You don't have that to worry about... Right. Table manners, sometimes you're walking while you're eating it, you know, so. Freedom. Are you talking about me? <laughs> <laughs> have you been watching me eat? <laughs> All right, so I have a, a word this week as well, of course. Are you ready? Yes. All right, let's have a look. Little? Yes. Littering? Little. Litter but No. <laughs> hey, that's two words. Little eats? Yes. Oh. Okay, so I cheated okay, a little two bit. Two words. Two words instead of one. Now, Little Eats, of course, is a reference to Taiwan's xiao shi. This is what we mm. call street foods. Right. And as you mentioned, street foods have, have been in the news lately. And of course, most prominently, we've seen that street foods from Taiwan have made it into a new Netflix show, which is called Street Foods. That's really exciting. That is exciting. So that's one of the things we're going to be talking about in our program today. Now, in addition to that, we're also going to be talking about a Gallup poll, which has found that Taiwan ranked lowest in the world when it comes to negative emotions. Another thing that we'll be discussing today is uh, the hashtag Taipei Hench, uh, which is trending on Instagram. It's a reference to a solar phenomena. That's what will be coming up today in hashtag Taiwan. Plus, also, let's take a look at this photo. Wow, look at that. Yes, can you guess what's happening there? Well, actually, I know what's happening there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can you guess? And it's uh, from somewhere in Taiwan. We'll be telling you exactly where. It's a first look at this phenomenon um, in a place in Taiwan. The first time we ever took a shot at that. That's so very exciting. We'll be getting to that in our parting shot. Our top story this week is the U.S. sending two warships passing through the Taiwan Strait. Now, it's the seventh time the U.S. has done so since July 2018. Now, let's take a look at the USS William P. Lawrence that passed by this week. Now, this was the first time that the U.S. Pacific Fleet used the Automatic Identification System, or AIS, which allows their position to be monitored publicly. Now, the Navy says that it was a routine passage, and, of course, this shows the U.S. commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific. Now, the U.S. and China are in a trade war and currently in trade talks. Now, recently, I spoke with top military expert, Danjiang University professor Alexander Huang. I asked him if the U.S. could be using Taiwan as leverage 
in trade talks with China. This was his response. Taiwan is not only a bargaining chip, it's a trump card. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, it's not because of how Trump's Taiwan is so... <laughs> yeah, Trump's trump card is Taiwan. Why? It's not only because they're, we think we are important. It, it's because that China said that Taiwan issue is the most sensitive ones. They directly told uh, President Trump even before he, uh, inaug he was inaugurated, because he picked up a phone call from President Tsai Ing-wen. That's right. And China reacts. So, so President Trump got that taste, mm -hmm. even before right. becoming the president. And he understand that Taiwan is the big bottom. If you really push hard, and, and the Chinese will jump They'll really react. high. <laughs> Uh, and, and that's so, why Taiwan is the trump card. Is that good for us or bad for us? Uh, I, I think it's good and bad, it, depending on how we uh, work it out. Mm -hmm. And the key is uh, mutual trust. Do you think we can trust the U.S. as an ally to be there for us if we're in trouble with China? I think we can trust the United States. Um, but, but personally, I don't trust that how fast and how much mm. that they can do in time when I need it. Mm -hmm. I think the United States is for Taiwan. I think we got so many commonalities, shared values, and the United States like Taiwan a lot. Uh, at least Taiwan is a full-fledged democracy and, and shows a better path to all the Chinese people, according to, according to Vice President Mike Pence. So, so Taiwan is valuable, but, but uh, in terms of military conflict, we have to understand that there are limitations based on geography, availability, mm -hmm. uh, and combat experience, uh, and also uh, logistics. Again, that was Danjiang University professor Alexander Huang. And if you'd like to check out the entire interview, you can go to RTI English on YouTube, and you'll find a playlist called Taiwan Today. Now, we also have an announcement for American citizens and also anyone that wants to use the services of the American Institute in Taiwan, which is the de facto U.S. Embassy in the absence of official ties. The old AIT building closed on May 1st, and they are moving to a new location in the Nehu District of Taipei on May 6th. Uh, and if you would like to find out more information about that, you can watch our exclusive interview with AIT, and that is available on the Taiwan Insider Facebook page. We now turn to the Taiwanese food scene. Now, for many years, Taiwan's food was a best kept secret, but recently I think the rest of the world is starting to catch on. Now, as you know, Natalie, I'm a huge fan. I have been eating Taiwanese yes, food. Yes, you bring food in all the time. We love it. <laughs> yes, I try to bring it into the office, um, but I also have a professional connection to food. I'm not a chef. However, I have been hosting a show here on RTI called Feast Meets West. Get it? Feast meets West. <laughs> yes, it's a great show too. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, now, my co-host Ellen Chu and I, uh, we are going to be celebrating our 10th anniversary of Feast Meets wow, West. Wow, congratulations. 10 years? Thank you. So how yes. are you going to celebrate? So we'll have a look at this uh, photo. I want to show you uh, what we're going to be doing. Uh, you can see we are at a temple. Now, when we first started the show 10 years ago, we asked the local deity what would happen to the show. And what did the, they say? The answer was, uh, the new show is going to be like uh, an untested horse. And so if you, <laughs> if you train it well, you spend a lot of time uh -huh. and effort on it, then it will become easy to ride. That's the right answer for anything, though. I think so. <laughs> well, it's, it's come true. Like, I, right, I'm right. pretty happy with You've the way things... You've trained it well. We've worked certainly You've very worked hard well on with it. it. Yes. Now, what is the answer that we got this year? You're going to have to tune in on Saturday. This Saturday is our... A uh, 10th anniversary, so almost 520 episodes on. It's incredible. And that's amazing. You can do so many different topics. Yes. On food. Yes. And actually, Taiwanese food has been featured quite often in recent years in global media. And most recently, last week, Netflix started a new TV show called Street Foods, and it did feature Taiwan. Let's take a look at part of the trailer. If someone has to taste a real food, Authentic food, it has to be street food. 
The first season features nine episodes that celebrate the local heroes of street food across Asia. In Thailand, India, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam. In the Taiwanese episode, shot in the central city of Jai, features fish head soup, goat stew, chicken rice, and tofu pudding. Now, there's been some question why they chose Jai because actually, I think、uh, Tainan is a, a lot bit, more famous. Yeah, more well known for, for its、yes. little eats. Yeah, for sure. Same with Taipei. And Taipei as well.、Um, however, I think they're focusing on kind of rich characters. There are people who are local heroes、uh, who are creating street food. So it's kind of Person based as well as being food based.、Mm-hmm. And recently, the street eats of Taipei also made the news. The second Michelin Guide to Taipei came out. That's in a section called Bib Gourmand,、uh-huh. or Bib Gourmand as we say en français.、Uh, now, in just a moment, we're going to tell you about some of the street foods which made the list this year. But first, what exactly is the Bib Gourmand and what does it take to get on that list? That's the focus of today's Taiwan Explained. In today's Taiwan Explained, I'm going to tell you about the Bib Gourmand. It's part of the illustrious Michelin Guides. Not the part that gives out stars to top chefs, but it's a place where you'll find some of Taipei's street foods. Okay, you're going to do it in 60 seconds, right? I'm going to、And、try. I warn you, I have a buzzer this time. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are、All、you、right. ready? Yes. Go. Okay, the name Bib comes from Bibendum, which is the French word for the Michelin man.、Uh, gourmand, of course, is a person who loves to eat, so this is a sign of good quality, good value cooking. Now,、uh, what does it take to be eligible? In Taiwan, you have to offer a three course meal. For under a thousand Taiwan dollars, it's about 32 US dollars. That's very easy for street foods. Now, 24 out of the 58 selections in the Bib、uh, Gourmand this year are street foods. That's 40% of the total. So you can see how important street foods are here to the cuisine in Taiwan. Now, where are these foods sold? They're sold usually at stalls or at open front restaurants like this one, Lan Jia Gua Bao, which sells steamed buns. Look at that.、Mm, looks good.、Uh, pickled mustard greens,、uh, stewed pork belly, crushed peanut. Now, the list is not free from criticism. One local gourmand, Xu Tianling, says that the list looks like a blogger's guide, and there are regrettably some misses. <laughs> Very good, Andrew. You were on time! <laughs> Finally, for the first time, All I think. All right. <laughs> nice job. Thank you. And that was our Taiwan Explain for the week. And now for a closer look at some of the foods, the street foods from Taipei, which made it onto this year's Bib Gourmand. Let's have a look at this report. Simple but addictive, cabbage rice and clear pork rib radish soup are the comfort food everyone craves. That's what the Taipei Michelin Guide had to say about one of its newest selections, served up at the Yensan Night Market in Taipei. And the customers agree. I have a lot of traditional flavor. It's tender and very traditional, they say. It takes seven or eight hours to make the stock, but like many local street foods, it only costs a couple US dollars. There are eight Taipei night markets represented in the 2019 list. Three of those are new additions since last year Yensan, Gongguan, and Huaxi Street. This year's list includes a dessert for the first time hot sesame or peanut dumplings on shaved ice. And the least expensive food on the list? A sweet pastry baked in a clay oven. It's just 12 Taiwan dollars or about 40 cents US. Now, as we mentioned at the top of this segment, Taiwan's street foods have been kind of under the radar for many years. Do you think that the world is starting to catch on? I do. I mean, I see a lot of reports in major media like CNN, you、mm-hmm. know, telling us we have the best dessert in the world, or、mm. all kinds of reporters and travel bloggers, food bloggers are reporting about Taiwan food.、Mm-hmm. And also, Taiwanese food is getting really popular in the United States.、Mm, that's true. So we、that's、see all kinds、true. of, like, even the New Yorker did a feature on Taiwanese food in New、mm-hmm. York. That's so, right. So, a lot of great coverage about our food and、mm-hmm. drinks. Absolutely. Boba, boba tea is really taken off all around the world. We also saw、uh, the Eater,、uh, sorry, Eater is a、uh, Vox Media、uh, website. They did a huge in depth、uh, section all on Taipei foods, which was amazing. If you have the opportunity, you should check that out. We'll definitely have the links for you in the show notes、uh, for today's program. 
So uh, it's good to see that uh, food is from Taiwan is, is hitting other countries in the world. You know, interestingly, I went to Haifa in Israel and even saw a Taipei restaurant there. Really? So if wow. it makes it to Haifa, you know it's gone international. <laughs> All right. Well, next to our segment, Taiwan by Number. All right, every week we introduce a facet of Taiwan via a number. Now, in just a moment, we're going to take a look at about how artificial intelligence can help us detect depression. But first, let me ask Andrew if you can guess a number. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like testing you, Andrew. It's fun. I'm not sure I like being tested. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Okay, so this is the number uh, percentage. Guess the percentage of people who have depression that actually seek help. In Taiwan. Okay, the percentage of people in Taiwan that have depression that seek help. Oh goodness, I'm gonna say 15%. Okay, let's we'll find out after we take a look at this new invention. Okay. Researchers from National Taipei University of Technology are making diagnosing depression easier. Through collaboration with a Taiwanese tech company, they've developed an AI-powered device. <laughs> Professor Liu Yihong of the university's Department of Engineering says the device displays the abnormal brain activity of people suffering from depression. In just 90 seconds, it can begin to display a patient's brainwaves. Once put into production, this device will serve as a diagnostic tool, giving doctors something to go on beyond a patient's appearance, speech, or behavior. The device has already attracted the interest of doctors. The head of the psychiatry department at Taipei Veterans General Hospital is among them. She says she looks forward to taking advantage of the biological information the device will provide. Most importantly, though, the device will help those with depression get the help they need. The number that might benefit is huge. More than 1.2 million people suffer from depression in Taiwan alone. The device could launch as early as 2021. That's a cool looking device, isn't it? Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, so I'm yeah. glad Taiwan is really helping out um, on this issue. Well, first, let's get back to the question I asked you. Okay. Okay, so I asked Andrew the percentage of people who have depression in Taiwan that seek help. Let's look at that number. Wow. Yeah, you were close. That's good. Actually, well, it's better than what I was expecting. Right. But still, 20% is low if you, you know, take into consideration that people with depression obviously could benefit from seeking help. Right. Yeah. Actually, the WHO has said that depression is the leading cause of ill health and disabilities worldwide. Wow. So it's a really important issue. And, um, you know, I know in Taiwan and in Asia, a lot of people have stigmas about mental health and mm -hmm. seeking help, but it's something that we really should um, not be afraid to do. Absolutely. You know, I, I, myself included, so many people that I know have talked to a counselor or somebody who can offer advice before, and it, it really is useful, and it shouldn't be something that you're ashamed about. Right. I know in Taipei, there's the Community Services Center. They have great counseling for people who need counseling in English. And there's also, you know, informal um, counseling available at schools, churches. I know family and friends have tried that, and it's been very helpful. Absolutely. So if so, you are in need, reach out. Yes. Also, on the topic of negative emotions, mm. Gallup just this week came out with a survey about the um, amount of negative emotions that people experience in each country around the world. And Taiwan had the least in the whole world. Least negative emotions. That's right. Wow, okay. So Andrew, can I ask you the same questions <laughs> <laughs> that they asked these respondents? Okay, okay, yes. And they're asking them about the day before, yesterday. Okay. All right, so I have to think about what happened yesterday. Yes. Yesterday was my birthday, so, so maybe I'll have lots of positive emotions. So you more positive <laughs> than usual. Okay, so did you experience worry yesterday? Worry. I worry every day, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you experience anger yesterday? Anger. Did I make you mad? <laughs> no, you didn't. You didn't make me mad, but I did go to a restaurant that was advertising that you got free steak if it was your birthday, and they didn't give it to me. Oh, no! <laughs> they said you have to tell us when you, you know, reserve the table. Are you serious? So I was a little angry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I might be too. <laughs> did you experience physical pain yesterday? 
I did. Yes. You did. I have Aww. I have back issues. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. You just so, came back from a trip. I know it's kind of being hard on to a travel. plane and having back pain. Yes. Not fun. Yeah. I've had that as well. I'm gonna go see my massage guy. All we'll, right. we'll fix it out. <laughs> <laughs> did you experience stress yesterday? Stress. Um, I'm gonna say no. It was a rare day that I did not experience. You had the day stress. off. I had the day and off. And it's your birthday. <laughs> Labor day. Yes. <laughs> so okay, I'm glad you. Didn't experience stress. How about sadness? Sadness? No, actually, I, I wasn't sad at all yesterday. I was pretty happy. I'm a pretty happy dude. Yeah. All right. I'm very yeah, fortunate. Yeah, you yeah. are a very positive person. But if, even if you aren't happy, it's okay to embrace that negative emotion. You know, if that's the way you are, just sit with it and see, see what's going on. Right, and yeah. be willing to do something to deal with it, right? Absolutely. Right. Reach out, talk to a friend. Right. And of course, you can also talk to a counselor, as we mentioned earlier as well. There was also a, a report on positive emotions. So mm -hmm. let's take a look at that. Now look at that. Taiwan was still above average in every category. Wow. So I wonder if <laughs> people are really that yeah, well-rested. I know a I... lot of people are really overworked in Taiwan. <laughs> that doesn't reflect so, my day yesterday. Yes. So anyways, that was a very interesting report, I thought. Absolutely. And we do have an interactive global map in our um, information below in our show notes. Um, you can click on any um, country and find out how they're doing emotionally. Excellent. Isn't that cool? I'm going to do that later. Up next, we have a segment called Hashtag Taiwan, and we're going to be talking about a solar phenomena. In today's Hashtag Taiwan, we are going to be talking about a hashtag called Taipei Henge. And we're going to go to Instagram, or as we say here in Taiwan, IG. I think in the US we say Insta, right? Yeah, I think that's kind of cool. Insta. <laughs> Insta. <laughs> so we are going to be uh, talking about some posts that have to do with this solar phenomena. Let's yes. have a look. Wow, right. look at those posts. So you can see that these are all pictures of the sun setting at the end of a city street here that's, in Taiwan. That's right. Now these images all have the same Chinese hashtag, Xuanru, which literally means suspended sun. So where does the hashtag Taipei Henge come from? Well, it was inspired by Manhattan Henge. Let's take a look at this. This is thousands of people in Manhattan trying to get the perfect shot of the sun setting between two buildings. And this phenomenon happens twice every year in cities around the world. Now you might be surprised to learn who coined this term, Manhattan Henge. It was this guy. This is American astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson who has a massive cult following of his own. When he was 15, he visited Stonehenge, that massive rock formation in the UK, which lines up with the sunset and sunrise points. This photo, because it has the sun behind it, I think we should give it the hashtag Stonehenge Henge. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, Neil, years later, took a photo in New York City. Mm -hmm. And that was the sun sitting at the end of the city street. And that's when he coined the phrase Manhattan Henge. Mm -hmm. So cities all over the world now observe the same phenomena. So if you uh, search for Paris Henge or Tokyo Henge, uh, these hashtags, you'll find all kinds of images, really cool images on the internet. Now, late last year, photos of this solar phenomena began popping up in southern Taiwan. Let's check out Kaohsiung Henge. You can see it there. And that was That's posted. a lot of people. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and the reason was, and this is actually, we should say, this is by Edge0920 on Instagram. The reason why Kaohsiung Henge was trending on social media late last year is because the city's tourism bureau shut down a section of an east-west street. And also they worked with local hotels to offer uh, discounts to mark the occasion. That's really cool. And yeah. now it's come to Taipei. Let's take a look. Well, actually, um, <laughs> this is uh, colored in by somebody. He yes. couldn't get the shot that day. Um, he had to leave for work or something. But um, the next day, uh, the weather wasn't very cooperative. So he didn't yeah. get the shots the next two days. It was raining. But yes. we still have a chance, right, this That's week? That's right. Never fear. There's still time to get those Instagrammable shots of Taipei Henge. Uh, we're going to post information in our show notes below. Uh, you can still get some shots between now and May 6th. So that's our hashtag Taiwan for the week. Be sure to follow us on social media and leave us a comment. We would love to hear from you. 
And now let's take a look at our parting shot. Now let's take a look at the photo that we saw earlier on um, our show today. Wow. Can you guess what that is? An exciting natural phenomenon that happens in Taiwan. And I'm going to say it happens in the water, right? <laughs> right. That's a picture in the ocean. Um, let's take a look at our video and get a closer look at this phenomenon. Wow. That is coral releasing eggs and sperm and they're going to float to the top of the ocean to meet and fertilize. Mm, wow. Now, uh, this actually was taken by Academia Sinica's Dr. Alan Chen starting... There he uh, is. He went deep sea diving last week to catch this partner. site. Now, this happens once a year around the lunar birthday of Matsu, the goddess of the sea. It's very fitting, right? Uh, researchers have filmed footage from Kanding and also Green Island in previous years. Now, this is the first time that they have gotten footage from just off the coast of Taidong in southeastern Taiwan. Yes, that was beautiful. And that is our Taiwan Insider for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. And we hope that you'll um, follow us on social media. That's right. Uh, and check out also our show notes below. We'll have all sorts of information and some links for you to follow if you want to find out more information. For Taiwan Insider, I'm Andrew Ryan. I'm Natalie So. See you next week. Bye-bye.